I want to tape this. Do you mind? No, you can tape. Uh, you know, trying to recall hearing uh, the German command uh, to fall out the next day if I was Jewish. And at that time I was living in the barracks next to Roddy. And Roddy, I remember gathering around him with some of the other sergeants and he didn't say anything until finally he instructed all the sergeants to have the entire American prisoner of wars fall out in the morning as we usually did to be counted by the Germans. And then I tried to recall trying to sleep that night and I still had pains in my legs when I was sleeping. And I, I remember holding my legs you know, it wasn't bad when I was standing, but lying down, <clears throat> my feet were really frozen. But I got up with everybody else in the morning and formed up, and there I was standing alongside Roddy when uh, Siegmund came and said, you can't all be Jews. And I remember, what the hell is Roddy gonna, how, how's he gonna get out of this? And it was amazing to hear him, <clears throat> what he said. <clears throat> Not only said we were all Jews, he added that, um, under the Geneva Convention, we only have to give you our name, rank, and serial number. And when uh, Siegmund touched his forehead with his Luga, I thought it was all over for Roddy. Because he said, you will order the Jews to step forward or I will shoot you right now. My first reaction was uh, Roddy was going to be killed because he wasn't going to issue the order. And then he came up with uh, the remark that saved him and saved us. He said, the war is almost over. You know, you can shoot me, but you're going to have to shoot all of us because you're going to be a war criminal. And I thought I tried to recreate that scene in my mind to make sure that's the way it happened. <clears throat> so that's it. I didn't realize that you knew Roddy so well. I didn't realize that you were such good, you were good friends uh, before. Oh, well, I met Roddy the first day I was in the army. Yeah, I didn't realize that till I read the book. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I was sent, after I was inducted, I was sent to uh, Fort Jackson in South Carolina to join the 422nd Regiment. Right. And Roddy was the uh, master sergeant. Right. He was the guy who uh, trained you in basic training. Right. He was the guy who recommended me for the infantry school. Once you go to the infantry school, you're on a, a path. You graduate as a corporal. 
and you're on a path to a, a promotion in the non-commissioned ranks, and it was also a path for me to get into the Air Corps. Right. Which I you were so was close. My dream, my dream to be a I know a fighter pilot. So Roddy was responsible for that, and uh, as fate would have it, I was sent back right to the regiment yeah. before going overseas. Yeah, I, I read about this in the book. Is there anything, yeah. are there any stories, less that you remember that you would have liked to have seen put in the book? Is there anything, anything? Well, there are a couple of guys I, I was friends with uh, in the Air Corps, uh, other guys who were training to be fighter pilots. This was in Stuttgart, Arkansas. But they went to different places, so I, I lost contact with them. Uh, there's a, a, a photograph, there's a photograph of me with one of them wearing a flight uniform. I don't know whether you ever saw that. <clears throat> and then there's another photograph with me in a rowboat uh, with two other guys from the Air Corps. <clears throat> uh, but I don't, I don't uh, remember their names because we lost contact. Yeah. And then uh, by that time I was a sergeant. So when I returned to uh, 422nd, I was one of the leading uh, non-coms. I and my friend Frank Sorenzia was the other one. Frank came from Brooklyn, and we we bonded during basic training. Did you ever see him after the war? No. Uh, after the war, I was involved in becoming a lawyer. Yeah. You know, I spent the next three years in Cambridge studying the law. So the only one I really kept in contact with was Sonny Fox and Paul Stern, Skip Friedman. Those three guys were my closest friends from prison camp. What did Skip do eventually? Skip, Skip was a lawyer. And uh, during during a uh, prison camp, he would talk about his girlfriend. Uh, she was Penny, beautiful. The Penny pic Clausen. The picture in the book, she was really beautiful. Yeah, Penny Clausen. Yeah. She had a twin sister, yeah. Ruth, who looked just like her. Yeah. And Skip wanted me to get together with Ruth. Wow. And I went out to Cleveland, spent some time. See, that's not in the book. I don't think, is that in the book? I don't well, think so. Yeah, I The don't... fact that I went out there. No. But by that time, I was, uh, I had met Marcy. Right. But she, she had another boyfriend. Harold Scholl. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, when, when I met Marcy, she and Harold were the lead players in the school play called Skin of Our Teeth. And uh, she really wasn't interested in me until April when I was accepted to Harvard Law School. That, that had here was somebody who was marriage material because 
I, I was going to have a profession. And, and uh, April of 1946 was when we started dating. And uh, December of 46, we announced our engagement and we'll marry the following year. So, although Ruth was quite attractive, and I think she liked me, it was just impossible. Let me ask you a question. Um, <clears throat> when you went off to fight, there was yeah. a... Did I what? What do you think about, what would you ta tell a young man or woman who... It's not coming through. What would you say today to a young man or woman going into service who wants to serve the country today? You mean about getting serious with a woman? No. Going into the army or navy. Uh, well, if you're going... <clears throat> well, first I would say it's really an opportunity for you to grow up and learn some basic things about life. Because life in the military. <laughs> You know, you're, you're always subject to taking orders and giving orders. And that takes responsibility and someone who has good judgment. And, and you, you uh, even in a peacetime, that's an environment which trains you. I think, I, I think I developed more in those three years in the army so far as the kind of person I am. Uh, but you were lucky to have Roddy as a sergeant training you. Were the other sergeants as good or like him in any way? Uh, well, some of them. And then there were some uh, whom we didn't like to, to uh, self-interested in advancement. But um, by and large, you have the opportunity to grow up in a good way, to learn good habits, you know, taking care of yourself, not taking drugs. Uh, the military changes you. Of course, it's very dangerous now because you're going to be sent to parts of the country which are really dangerous. We have 35,000 troops in the Middle East, you know, all, all over Africa and uh, Asia. It's, uh, those guys are uh, on the firing line. <clears throat> yeah. And you, every day there's a couple of more that are killed or wounded. And <clears throat> But I think those who survive are stronger for yeah. guys like, uh, <clears throat> you know, Pete Buttigieg. He spent uh, two years overseas. <clears throat> for him, it was very difficult because he's, he's gay. <clears throat> but 
I think it shaped him. <clears throat> anyway. All right. That's, that's how I feel. I'm going to stop the video. Any, uh, any, anything that you'd want to share for posterity before I stop this uh, video? Uh, okay. <clears throat> we can do it by email. Yeah, but before I stop the video, is there anything you want to say for posterity? Uh, I want to say thank you. <laughs> You've been very important to me these last few years. And uh, I want to express my love and appreciation for you. Wow. I wish you a wonderful life, wherever it is. I don't think you're going to be out of the country forever. I think you'll be back. And there's a lot you can do. You, you're you still young. Well, you're, you're 52. You got... You can have 50 years. And and you... Knock on wood. Uh, you, you have the wherewithal to let your inner emotion, your inner drive shape your life and make it happier. I think you're doing that to some extent now, taking a house in Alamos. You know... <clears throat> spent a year over in the Pacific. Uh, it's not only fun, I think it's life-changing for you. Absolutely. You've got an ability to relax and express your thoughts and writing in every other way. So that makes me happy. And, you know, I'm also happy about my other loved ones. Yeah. They're in good <clears throat> joy. Uh, the boys, Jimmy and Eddie, Sherry's children, they're all busy with their families and their careers. Yeah. And they have a degree of, of, of confidence in themselves. So... You know, I, I, I'm i thankful for that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I live my... And my days are, are very happy. I don't worry about dying uh, because I've... I'm ready. If it comes, it isn't something I fear. And uh, I'm confident that I leave behind people who knew me and loved me. Yes. And will re remember me. So what more can you ask? <laughs> it sounds good. It sounds now, good. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Did it come out? Yes. I'm stopping now. <clears throat>